Welcome to Slash Forward. Sometimes I stay awake at night puzzling over what separates man from animal. But then I remember that man is animal, and it brings me great comfort. This relationship, deep in both time and symbolism, will be fully explored via the anthropological thesis presented in the 1986 film Link. Jane, played by Elizabeth Shue, is a zoology student who makes special arrangements for some up-close and personal monkey lessons from celebrated primatologist Dr. Philip at his sprawling estate that is surrounded by roving packs of dogs and occupied by three chimpanzees. Will she, in her thirst for knowledge, manage a direct line of communication with her primate hosts? And if so, will this allow her to see the danger hidden in plain sight that risks her life, as well as the lives of all of the numerous people who take the four-hour trip to visit this isolated estate over the course of a weekend? There really is a lot happening here, so be sure to pay close attention. Also, there are a couple other primate-based films featured on the channel. Check them out and leave a comment identifying which style of psychotic animal you find most horrifying. Let's get to it. We open in an exotic landscape within which we find ourselves just absolutely groove into the beat of our ancestors. Oh yeah. Once we've worked that out, we take a primal grunting first person tour of a residential building where we ascend a trellis and spook out a little girl. She holds her breath against the ominous sounds of rooftop disturbances as her parents enjoy an evening of primate pornography. The spell is broken and they're compelled to act only upon young Becky's blood curdling scream. They comfort her against the invisible dangers conjured in her mind, not realizing that just feet away, the pigeons have been converted to bird food in terms of what's being fed, not who is eating. This happens to be right by the London College of Sciences, whose towering spires of limestone are much less imposing in the morning light. Jane arrives at the primatology class facilitated by Dr. Philip, who is noting the relatively high intelligence of the chimpanzee. When it's time to test the subject's strength and bloodlust, he brings down several volunteers and unlocks the cage. What they discover is that brute force is futile, but the doctor has trained Imp to act in accordance with his will. Before he can teach them anything practical, he's called away to another lecture. But Jane is hungry for opportunity and has an unquenchable desire to become the doctor's assistant. Unfortunately, she is a female, and the doctor has been blackpilled pretty hard. Also, the listing she's responding to was actually a call for volunteers who could provide sperm samples. As he tightens up Imp's cage, lamenting his capacity for escaping and appetite for cats and birds, he has a second thought about needing an assistant. Do you, um, cook? Clean, stuff like that. Well, I'm female. With the promise of a little cash in her pocket, plus room and board, she agrees to what sounds like a choice deal for her. A couple of weeks later, she's being transported across the English countryside, well out into no man's land. The cabbie warns her of the dogs that patrol the area to keep out trespassers. And as they finally arrive, she discovers just how lucrative academia can be, while also regretting that she settled for 40 pounds a week. Upon entering, she finds herself in the strange company of a chimp butler, who's eager to tend to her every need. He escorts her to the bathroom, implying his desire to have her wash up. But after noting the doctor's imminent arrival, she gets right to work answering the phone for him. The absent-minded professor is surprised to see her, not realizing that today is the 15th. He gives his first behavioral introduction, which is that a soft hand will get you chimp smacked around here. When she notifies him of a Mr. Bailey waiting on the phone, he answers and proceeds to have a conversation that implies he's in some sort of breed and buy situation with the primates. The doctor then introduces uses her to Link and helps her navigate primate niceties before having Link retrieve Voodoo, a large female that he just sold to a zoo. He warns Jane of the importance of keeping your head on a swivel around here. He has to do most of his work far from civilization due to the inherently dangerous nature of his animals. Jane gets dressed more appropriately while Dr. Philip warms up some Earl Grey. They sip and watch as the chimps play their chimpy games, and he lays down some ground rules for her. Always be dominating, always show forgiveness to de-escalate disputes, and always mind your own business, otherwise they have free reign of the grounds. At dinner, Jane reveals that her dream is to one day own a large property like this one that she can use as an animal sanctuary. The doctor then shares a playful anecdote about a friend he had who did the same thing, and ended up severely mauled by his animals. Leg off after the knee, and uh, testicles. Off. They discuss Jane's casual relationship with her boo David over cigars and cognac. Link then shows off his mastery of fire, which he occasionally employs as a social smoker. Jane does not approve, but he really couldn't be happier. The next morning, Jane wakes up to the strange sensation of fruit. 
and finds that Link helped himself into a room for the sake of hospitality. And to watch her sleep, she comes out right as the doctor returns from the post. And after requesting some coffee and aspirin, they get things started in the lab. She's to take a nonverbal IQ test in competition with Imp and with little warning before it starts. So it takes her a minute to get going, but when she does, she schools Imp on his sequences of shapes and colors, eventually sending that little bitch to scream in the corner. As a natural empath, she finds this unfair, but the doctor attempts to demonstrate that they've started on equal footing and that the primary factor at play here is the magnificent difference between humans and chimps. He also assures her that she'll be thinking of things very differently once they're done with their work. As she leaves to make dinner, he gifts her a copy of his newest manuscript to pour over. When she returns with his Greek goddess salad, it's absolute chaos in the monkey house, and he drives her away so he can regain control. This happens just in time for her to feel the call from Mr. Bailey again, making sure the doctor will be bringing Voodoo over, bored and not allowed to venture upstairs, and she naturally begins exploring the space beneath the floorboards. In the lab, the music jams out as it makes a mockery of the doctor's reflexes, and Link defies direct orders by releasing Voodoo from her cage and symbolically eschewing his formal sports coat. Downstairs, Jane finds a dusty old wine cellar that has a secret tunnel that takes her through the rocky cliffside to a beautiful beachy alcove. Excited about the possibility of making a puka shell necklace, she returns to tell the doctor what she found, but he very rudely requests she leave him be. Would you leave me alone? So he can give his full and undivided attention to wrestling his monkeys. When she circles back around to the kitchen, Link is there getting ready to pop in some cinnamon rolls. She maintains her zero tolerance policy for chimpanzee baking and goes to the newly found basement to turn off the gas but it was apparently already off because it fires up instead. Link then leads her to his cipher where he communicates through a symbol translating interface. He tries to convince her he can make some bomb-ass stuffed mushrooms. However, she gives no quarter on her position here. Jane goes to put him out, but then notices that Dr. Phillips' car is gone, indicating he has gone to see Mr. Bailey without saying goodbye. When she goes back inside, Link has, indeed, cooked phone. She follows the rule of forgiveness for this, then goes to see where Mr. Bailey lives, and it's clear out in London a four-hour drive. That night, she's awoken by some strange noises coming from the lab. She retrieves the key from the doctor's office to find out what up. And what up is that Imp is stuck in his cage and whinging excessively. She tries to cheer him up a bit by offering to get him food and playing a little game where he points and she opens all the doors. It's incredibly whimsical, but ends with a surprise drop-in from Voodoo's corpse. She turns to Link for answers, but he doesn't say anything. Later on, she decides to go look for Dr. Philip, requesting that Link hang back at the house in case he returns. He does follow her out a ways, but she solves that problem by chucking a stone at him. But then, as she jogs down the dirt road, she runs across one of those patrol dogs she'd been warned about. She does an admiral job of outrunning the hound long enough to get back to the fence, at which point Link goes savage on the beast. Back at uni, Jane's boyfriend David is trying to check in with his gal, and it's a good thing he did because it reveals that there's a second phone in the house. He and Jane have a brief, stilted conversation that's cut short when Link decides to dangle off the line. Later on, Jane decides that all this monkeying around has put her in the mood to relax in a warm bath. Link decides that he wants to be a part of that, which he seems to be okay with at first. But then he really starts staring hard, leering like a legit pervert and skeeving her out. So the plan changes to staying dirty and putting her clothes back on. Jane wakes up later to the sound of gravel grinding under tires, and finally gets a chance to meet Reg Bailey in his flat. He claims he's been waiting on Dr. Philip for two days now, and his client is getting antsy. He insists on getting his hands on that sweet, sweet chimp and is fairly pushy about it. So, Dane shares the bad news of Voodoo has passed. He thinks he can get a few pence for her corpse, but he'll deal with that after completing his secondary task, which was to euthanize Link. Jane hasn't heard about this and can't confirm with the doctor, so she tries to dissuade him. In response, his tone quickly turns to one of sexual aggression. Then we get the sense that Link understands why this turd is here. No matter, because Reg is a big man. Although, while he was feeling pretty confident about beating a chimp, he doesn't dare face down two. And for good reason, we see, as Link is able to lift his whole caravan. He rides off discouraged, shouting off threats about tattling to the authorities about their little illegal monkey preserve. Later, we see they've worked into a little groove of playtime and food prep. But after hearing an odd noise, Jane discovers that Link does not treat kindly those who even mildly annoy him. For punishment, she casts him out of the house. In response, he demonstrates his true primate power. 
It's not enough to gain access, and she breaks a rule by withholding forgiveness and flaunting her new relationship with Imp. They even laugh and roll around in full view, with Imp taunting the much larger beast as a storm rolls in. Imp inadvertently hits one of the doctor's lab logs, and Jane hears him explain how one of the chimps is jacked up on carbs and has a fairly robust pattern of brainwaves. But it also plays a rebuke he offered to one of the chimps that she recognizes from when she previously tried to check on him. Would you leave me alone? She ponders this for a while as the storm rips through. The next day, Jane visits the crow's nest to take a little look around the countryside for signs of life, and she spies Bailey's van. When she pulls up on it, the radio is tuned to an AM station discussing animal husbandry. But there's no sign of Reginald. Link pops out, and Jane tenuously floats the idea of driving into town for a root beer float, and Link indicates he fancies her his girlfriend. When the van won't turn over, she convinces Link to give her a push start. She wants to use this as a chance to rid herself of the ape, but the vehicle won't stay running. As she approaches an elbow, Link begins pushing again, only this time with his own agenda. She tucks and rolls at the last second, and afterward discovers this is his special spot for disposing of inconvenient truths. On the way back, her walk breaks into a run, and as we've already witnessed, she's fast as hell. Even so, she makes it in with barely a moment to spare. Imp then leads her to Dr. Phillips' gun, which she keeps on standby. Meanwhile, Link finds an entry point and Mission Impossible's his way toward them. He finds a weak spot to make his ingress, and they wait in horror as he attempts to break in. Unwilling to go down without a fight, she blasts blindly through the door and makes the mistake of setting down her firearm. Regardless, they are able to make it into the cellar fairly quickly. They proceed down the incredibly suggestive tunnel and take a few moments to soak in the natural beauty before their assured brutal death. Meanwhile, over the range, David and the boys are jamming out and cruising, pulling up right as Link disappears around back. They carefully make their way in, noticing immediate signs of danger. What are you doing? We don't even know if we've got the right house. Another house with monkeys? <laughs> but Jane always treats her guns poorly, so he refuses to leave without taking a look around. Tom heads outside because he's both soft and scared. In addition, he is a well enthusiast. A borehole lad. He does your typical depth check, revealing a precious secret that he takes to the grave. Out on the trail, Jane finally finds Bailey, and their meeting results in some minor bumps and scrapes. While back at the house, Dennis is easily lured to the door and ripped up on the mail slot. David emerges and studies the bloody hole as Link sneaks back upstairs just as Jane is sneaking back in downstairs. She prepares herself for a monkey duel, but finds that it's actually dinner time. They declare a truce and ends up being temporary, and requires her to bitch slap herself free. As she runs off, David wakes up, tucked under the floorboards, and hobbled. Outside, Jane finds the car, but has a hell of a time getting her turned around and out of the courtyard, and she eventually brings down the playscape. Then she hears David's calls for help, and after she frees him, they just barely manage to safely lock themselves behind the lab's steel door. Link then approaches from the roof side, as Jane fashions a temporary leg for David. They have another close call, and Jane ends up tossing David all over the house, re-breaking his leg several times on the way down to the cellar. Here, she sees the only way to survive is to outthink their adversary. She starts by opening up the gas, which now flows freely through an open pipe. Then, she begins antagonizing Link about how dumb he looks sucking on a cigar, using reverse psychology to prompt him to defiance by lighting up a fresh stogie. Unfortunately for them, this only creates a mild burn. Thankfully, however, he decides to party like an animal and go down with the ship. So while they brace against the fire winds, he swings freely through the house and finds a fitting place to die a magnificent death. In the morning, after being released by the wind's grasp, the young lovers emerge. Along their drive out, they retrieve Imp, and as a group, flee the abject horror of the English countryside. So here's a brief recap of some of the items that may have been confusing. We only ever get indirect indications of Link's strength and intelligence. Dr. Philip uses Link to help him secure and transport Voodoo when necessary, because Link is the only one capable of doing so. Outside of that, it's well established early on that chimpanzees are ten times stronger than the average human, and may rip you apart completely by accident. The anecdote he told about his friend who had a multitude of body parts removed by a chimp were a result of his return after a prolonged absence. The chimp in question was just happy to see him is all, so it's not established whether Link had preternatural strength or if it was just because he was a large large male chimpanzee. Link knew a variety of tricks and human traits because he was saved from a circus, so he had a lot of early training before he came to be part of the experiments. 
He was smart, but we only heard about this a little when Jane was listening to the doctor's tapes. He didn't really talk about it otherwise, and we have no insight into whether this was an abnormal level of intelligence or if it was a result of his experiments. Most of the other movies we've examined where animals run wild usually portray animals with enhanced abilities that are imbued upon them through the experimentation. In this case, it seems like the experiments were merely in primate behavior, and that the primates already came with whatever characteristics were presented. We really get the view that we're dropping into the story with Jane and not privy to any details that she would not have known about. For instance, all of this killing seems to have started from Dr. Philip deciding that it was time to put Link down. We're left to assume that Link must have overheard this conversation and decided to act, but we're never shown that he knows or how he knows, and we don't know why Dr. Philip intended to have him euthanized. This can be a bit confusing at times. The only other item that I really can't explain is the situation with the gas oven. She doesn't want Link cooking, so she throws the lever, but then it blows the oven and is clearly burning when they leave for the study. You would think it was a continuity error, but it was clearly intended and unmistakable in the way it blew up in Link's face. I assume this would come into play later, in that it would be consequential that the lever was the opposite of what she expected. But then, when it did come into play later, she switched it on again to let the gas blow out of the pipe, and it did. I may have missed something, but I don't get what was going on there. And this was particularly confusing because the director, Richard Franklin, earned a lot of goodwill by competently setting up the structure of the story and introducing ideas into play that would be relevant to how things unfolded later. For instance, when they were discussing what qualities separate humans from chimps in class early on, one ignorant bitch suggested pleasure killings or murder for non-sustenance reasons. The doctor points out that chimps have been observed to carry out coordinated attacks on competing groups for vengeance or strategic advantage. This ends up being the central theme of the movie as it progresses. There was also a lot of interesting camera work with coherent action, and Franklin wasn't afraid to let the danger linger in a bit of uncertainty by making the chimps not always visible. You didn't know where Link was, but you had a damn good idea that he was up to some monkey shenanigans. Finally, the film is centered around a strong performance by Elizabeth Shue, America's sweetheart in the 80s. This movie didn't really catch on, but it was only her second movie role, and she did it between Karate Kid and Adventures in Babysitting. It flew under the radar, but she basically popped off at the start of her career and shot to the moon after that. So you know she nailed her part in this one. Personally, it seemed to me like they just went out and found an aspiring zoologist to fill the role. It was that convincing. This is a film for fans of science-based horror. It's a type of movie that takes the thread of some interesting information and asks the question, what if this goes wrong? I read that Richard Franklin was thinking of it as sort of a Jaws on Land style film. I'm not sure if it has the same sort of impact, but it is similar in the slow way it builds itself up toward its conclusion. I think of it as being in the same vein as Demon Seed, Altered States, or The Brood. It's not as surreal or gory as some of those films are, but the underlying feel seems to be similar. Movies with a 70s or 80s aesthetic, where a very normal or clinical environment is utilized as the backdrop for some subversive experiments where the danger is lurking below the surface and isn't fully revealed until the third act. It's also a must-see for fans of the very specific and narrow subgenre of Animals Gone Wild. Oh, there is a dog that dies in this one, but it is very fake looking, if that is at all helpful to you. Before we go, I'd like to a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.